So we've got three new Apple Silicon chips with the release of the M3 family. And I say three, there's actually five. And uh, we've got a new colour, space black for the MacBook Pro. So now you've got three finishes to choose from, except you don't. And for the first time, the MacBook Pro 14 inch is available with the standard M chip, rather than just Pro and Max variants. Now that is a good thing, and also a bad thing. So. Before you trip over yourself in your rush to give Tim Cook your credit card, let's take a quick look at the choices available to make sure you don't end up buying the wrong MacBook Pro. If you watched Apple's Scary Fast event, then you'll know the highlights. We've got a new M3 family of chips, the standard M3, the M3 Pro, and the M3 Max, all built on TSMC's 3 nanometer process. And if you don't understand what a 3 nanometer process is, basically it means Apple can cram more transistors into the same physical space, at the same time as improving power efficiency and performance. Nice. Apple are claiming around 15% improvement in CPU performance for M3 over M2, which seems great. And it is, but it's the same margin of improvement that the M2 delivered over M1. And a lot of tech commentators seem to think that that wasn't enough. It'll be interesting to see if they say the same about this chip. And it is telling that Apple chose to compare the new M3 chips with the M1 family, not the M2. I guess they want to claim the biggest wins, but when you look at the various graphs that they showed, this may also be because it's not such a huge upgrade over M2. In fact, I'd probably say that most folks with an M2 family machine won't feel a massive urge to upgrade, unless you desperately need that new space black color. And you do need that new space black color. The biggest upgrade that the M3 family delivers is in the GPU, which just like the new A17 Pro iPhone chip, features Apple's redesigned graphics architecture. And this has something called dynamic caching, which allows the GPU to better optimize its memory to account for the variable power demands in graphics processing. Uh, ultimately, this results in better performance. And we're also seeing hardware ray tracing for the first time on a Mac. The demos look great, but Apple's graphs are predictably short on meaningful information, so we'll need to hold judgment until we can actually test the chips. But it is safe to say that you'll see graphics improvements across the whole family of the M chips. And of course, there are also refinements to the other parts of the system on chip, things which help optimize the Mac to allow it to punch above its weight in the areas of video processing and machine learning. We're going to dive into more detail on that on the channel soon, but for this video, let's just focus on the machines. Uh, starting with the iMac, which gets the M3 chip. That's a big step up over M1, so great news if you're in the market for an iMac. But there's no change to the design, size, or color options, and the keyboard, mouse, and trackpad still have the lightning port. No USB-C here. Uh, I will be doing a more detailed video on the iMac, so if you want to see that, you know you need to hit that subscribe and notify button down below. So let's switch our focus to the MacBook Pro. Now it's still the same great design available in 14 inch and 16 inch sizes. And there are three main changes, a new entry model, a new color, and a slightly brighter screen, which is now 600 nits for SDR content, which matches Apple's studio display. And that's a nice touch, but I expect most people won't be able to tell the difference. Apple are claiming up to 22 hours battery life, but the model that achieves this is the 16-inch MacBook Pro with the M3 Pro. The 14-inch models have smaller batteries, and those that have the M3 Max chip will definitely be more power hungry. Now what about that new color, space black? It looks great, and Apple are claiming it will be fingerprint resistant, uh, which it will need to be. Dark aluminium finishes do tend to show up the old finger grease. So I'll reserve judgment on it until I can see it in person, but I guarantee this is going to be a huge seller. Apple has taken a leaf out of the classic marketing playbook. Offer a new color and you'll sell more. Before you get too excited though, the space black finish is only available on MacBook Pro models with the M3 Pro or Max chips. The model with the standard M3 still gets the current space gray finish. But of course there's also that silver option. Let's talk about that entry model, which is replacing the 13-inch MacBook Pro, and it's about time. Uh, that said, it does now mean that entry-level model is $1,599 or an inexplicable £1,699 here in the UK. Yep, despite the exchange rate recovery and the reduction in iPhone prices, the MacBook Pro remains a financial kick in the plums for UK buyers. 
So whilst the entry price has increased for consumers, it allows Apple to claim that the MacBook Pro 14-inch range now starts from a lower price. To be fair, you are getting more for your money over that old 13-inch chassis. Buyers will get the much better XDR display, the better keyboard, the better speakers, the wider range of ports, and a notch. Uh, new chip aside though, some will see this as being worth the higher cost of entry alone. And it is nice to see that standard storage now starts at 512 gigabytes. However, despite all the improvements Apple has made to the GPU, it's going to be hobbled with the same paltry 8 gigabytes of unified memory as before. This is disappointing. Sure, 8 gigs on Apple Silicon is fine for everyday general computing, but this is a MacBook Pro. And we found that if you push the standard M machines, you can find the limits of an 8 gigabyte model fairly quickly. So you can and should upgrade the RAM to 16 gigabytes. Uh, let's do that and take a look at what happens. So I've got the Apple UK website on the left side of the screen and the USA website on the right hand side of the screen. And we'll do the same thing on both. Here's our entry level model. Let's just select that. And as standard, you can see this comes with eight gigabytes of unified memory. Uh, taking it up to 16 gigabytes is an extra $200 or 200 pounds. And that now pushes our price up to $1,799 or 1,899 pounds here in the UK. And the problem with that is that it now means that we only need to pay a further $200 or 200 pounds to get into the M3 Pro model. Or if you spec your standard M3 with 24 gigs of RAM, you're basically at the same price as the M3 Pro with 18 gigs of RAM, and that will be a significantly better machine. Sure, $200 or 200 pounds is not an insignificant sum of money, but as a percentage of the total cost of the machine, it's a relatively small jump to go from a 16 gig M3 to an 18 gig M3 Pro. Like previous families of these chips, the M3 has an eight core CPU. That's four performance cores, four efficiency cores. And the M3 Pro can have 12 cores, six performance, six efficiency. That's 50% more CPU cores. And you will see that performance difference in multi-threaded tasks and pro applications. Single threaded performance will be broadly the same across the whole M3 family. The M3 Pro can also have an 18 core GPU. That's eight more cores than standard M3. And that is gonna make a huge difference if you're doing anything like playing games or working on tasks that require graphics acceleration. Here's another gotcha though. There are two versions of the M3 Pro. You've got the full fat flavor with those 12 CPU cores and 18 GPU cores. And then there's also a bin version with 11 CPU cores and 14 GPU cores. And it's the bin version that we've been talking about here as the next step up from the M3 model. So with that bin chip, you are losing one of those performance cores in the CPU, but I'd still expect to see more than 30% multi-threaded improvement over this standard M3 chip. And the GPU should be in the order of 40% more performant, and perhaps even more because the M3 Pro has 50% more memory bandwidth too. Now, as an aside, I see that the memory bandwidth on M3 Pro is 150 gigs per second, whereas M2 Pro was 200 gigabytes per second. So I need to do a bit more digging on why that's been reduced. But there doesn't seem to be any difference in the media engine between M3 Pro and M3. So both chips have got the same video encoders and decoders. However, when it comes to external displays, the standard M3 can only drive one, whereas the M3 Pro can drive two external displays. There are also differences in the specs of the HDMI port. The M3 model is limited to a 4K 120 hertz display, but Pro and Max, they can do 8K at 60 hertz or 4K at 240 hertz. Next year, of course, the MacBook Air will get the M3 chips and it's gonna cost less than the MacBook Pro. So the only reason really to go for the M3 MacBook Pro is if you definitely want the form factor or the improved port selection and better display. Hello, Future Dave here. Sorry for the interruption, but there was something that I forgot to mention when I recorded this video. And that is that the entry-level 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M3 chip only has two Thunderbolt ports or two Type-C ports. And they're both on the left-hand side of the computer. With the Pro and Max models, you get three. So there's also one on the right-hand side. And that means you can charge the laptop from either side of the device. Uh, but you can't do that with the entry-level MacBook Pro. Uh, that's all, back to Dave of the past. So let's now talk about the Pro and Max chips. In the previous generations, the M1 and M2 family, the CPU on these two chips was basically the same. The main upgrades going up to Max were the GPU, memory bandwidth, and the media engine. 
But this time there is a fairly large difference in the CPU between these chips, which makes the price hike to the max perhaps seem a bit more sensible. So let's look at pricing now for the uh, M3 Pro machine. And we'll select the full fat flavour of the chip with the 12 core CPU, 18 core GPU for an additional $200 or £200. And that brings the price to $2,199 or £2,299. Now when you look at the specs page here, it seems like you can jump up to the max chip for an additional 400. Uh, but this isn't quite the case because the M3 Max has a minimum of 36 gigabytes of unified memory. So it's actually a jump of $800 or £800. Uh, you'll notice on the page that it auto selects the 36 gigabyte memory option. And our price is now at $2,999 or £3,099. Of course, we could have specced up our M3 Pro chip with 36 gigs of RAM, and then the difference between the two machines does become just $400 or £400. I say just, that's actually quite a lot of money. So what do you get for that additional spend? Particularly when we bear in mind that there are two versions of the Max chip, and the price that we're looking at here is for the binned Max chip. With this cheaper chip option, you lose two CPU cores, and they're both performance cores, and you drop 10 of those GPU cores. But if we compare that binned max chip with the full fat pro chip, is it worth that $400 upgrade? Well, if you go up to that binned max chip, you're gaining four performance cores and losing two efficiency cores. Now that'll be a decent step up in multi-threaded performance. I'd expect to see around 25% improvement on average. There's also double the memory bandwidth. This version of the max chip has 300 gigabytes per second, and that will make a difference in memory intensive applications, possibly widening the performance gap between these chips. And of course you are gaining 12 CPU cores over the Pro. The differences don't stop there. Max has two video encode engines and two ProRes engines. So if you're working with video editing applications, that will make a noticeable difference to rendering and playback performance. And the Max chip can support up to four external displays. Do all of those added features represent a $400 or £400 value? For some Pro users, I think it will be a no brainer. And with this binned M3 Max chip, you can spec up to 96 gigabytes of unified memory uh, for an additional $800 or £800. Let's now look though at the difference between this binned chip to the full fat M3 Max chip. And again, that seems like it's just another $300 or £300 step up, uh, but actually it's 500 because the minimum RAM for this particular chip is 48 gigabytes. And again, the configurator auto applies that additional upgrade. I do think this could be made a little bit clearer on the product configurator page. But anyway, what are we getting for that additional spend aside from the RAM? Well, there's two additional performance cores in the CPU, and that might translate to something like 15 to 20% additional multi-threaded performance. And you get another 10 GPU cores, and that is a massive upgrade to the graphics power. Finally, memory bandwidth increases to 400 gigabytes per second. And now you've also got two more memory options. You've got the 64 gigabyte option for 200, or you can go all the way up to a whopping 128 gigs if you're prepared to pay another thousand. That's quite the spec, but you'll notice that we're still only on 512 gigabytes of storage. And if you need more storage, you're gonna be paying a bit more Apple tax yet. Uh, best performance usually comes from two terabytes or above, but I'd say this spec deserves at least a one terabyte SSD. So let's add that to our MacBook Pro. And that brings the price for this full fat M3 Max version of the MacBook Pro with 48 gigs of RAM and a one terabyte drive to $3,699 or an eye-watering £3,799 here in the UK. Just for comparison, when I bought my 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max, again, I used this standard configuration with a one terabyte drive and I think that was £3,000. So uh, the equivalent laptop in the third generation has gone up by £800 here in the UK. Uh, that's a significant increase. It's a huge amount of money for a laptop, but if you've got a professional use case where you can make the most of the performance that's on offer, it's actually fairly easy to make a business case to purchase one of these machines. Uh, but consumers may need to think a bit harder before taking the plunge, especially if you don't have the workflow to take advantage of the performance. And if you want the 16 inch form factor, you can only have the full fat M3 Pro and the two M3 Max options. There's no possibility of a standard M3. So my initial conclusions. If you've already got an M2 family machine, I don't see any compelling reason to upgrade. 
When it comes to the Base M3 model MacBook Pro, if you desperately want the 14-inch MacBook Pro form factor, go for it. Otherwise, it's probably better to wait for the M3 MacBook Air. If you do decide to go for that 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M3 chip, uh, I don't think it's worth upgrading it beyond taking it up to 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, any further than that, and you're better off going for a base M3 Pro instead. Most creative professionals will be well served by one of the M3 Pro chips. If you work specifically in video production, or you need the very best in GPU performance, then look to the M3 Max instead. You do need to investigate all of the options carefully, because it's easy to make mistakes and end up with a machine that isn't the best fit for your needs. And remember, this is Apple. There are no upgrades. Sure, you can make use of external storage drives, but everything else is soldered in and can't be changed after you purchase. So if you're spending this much, budget a little extra for Apple Care insurance, and remember to back up your data regularly. Because if anything breaks on your MacBook Pro and it's got to go back for repair, you'll be losing anything that's stored on it. I will say that our web studio has bought a lot of these MacBook Pros in the M1 and M2 generation, and so far they've been extremely reliable. Now, actually, we've had no faults with the 14-inch and 16-inch models, but it's probably better safe than sorry. So I hope you found this useful. Please let me know in the comments if you're planning an upgrade. What are you going for? Is that space black finish making your credit card sweat? Or are you going to skip this generation and wait for the inevitable next best thing? Thanks as always for supporting the channel and spending some time with me today. I'll see you again soon for some more geekery.